The next time Flens breathes in, the smell of copper floods his nostrils. It's incredible how permeating that smell could be. Tangy and biting, it makes his stomach churn. He can feel it scraping against his tongue. His beak shifts and his face contorts into what griffins can manage for a grimace. Copper. The pipes and valves are all made of the stuff. Talons are always scratching and marking them, rending the surface and extruding that repugnant odor, leaving the owners marked as well. Rust claws, they called them, factory workers. Flens's eyes harden. He knows this is not a factory. He knows there is no more than copper on his claws. Copper. A moving beak breaks him from his thoughts. A dull splash of brown feathers on an endless tangle of copper. Always copper. The beak tells him that he's wanted on the line. He raises without a word, and the copper smell follows him as he goes. When Flens arrives at the line, the colonel is already waiting for him. It's just a title, of course. Cravill has been out of service for two decades. Nevertheless, he carries his formal title with pride. He leads his workers with an iron claw. His word is irrefutable. He runs the line. Flens pulls open the metal door, lined with copper, of course, and steps into the observation room, a tiny windowed box that overlooks the line. Colonel Craven is looking down at the dormant area, unmoving. It strikes him how much he defies his position. One would expect a grizzled, battle-scarred warrior, but Cravel's slate feathers are unmarred, his talons intact, his beak sharp. His eyes give it away, brown with flecks of darkened orange, so common in griffins, iron hard and razor sharp, the color of rust the color of copper. You wanted to see me, sir? Flens asks. Cravel doesn't move an inch. His beak hardly seems to move as he replies. Yes, Flens, I did. Stand with me, will you? It is not a question. His voice seemed so out of place. No rasp or bark. Just a soft lift that drifted through your ears like clogging smoke, clouding your judgment. When he spoke, you listened. There wasn't an alternative. Flint's moved to his side and stays a while, trying to rid his nose of that foul stench before more smoke fills his mind. I received your resignation today, Flint's. Flint gulps softly. The way the colonel's tongue rolls over the letters of his name turns his stomach over, adding to the constant uh, malice from the copper. Yes, sir, Flint says. You wish to leave here, Flint? Yes, sir. Why is that, Flint? The younger griffin tries to gulp again, but this one gets stuck halfway down and Flens has to force it down with a slight cough before he can speak again. It is the smell, sir. I can't take the smell, Flens says, shifting uneasily. The smell of what? The smell of metal, sir. Of c copper, sir. Copper? Yes, Colonel. Are you sure it's just the copper that's bothering you, Flens? Cravel Smoke says. I, I don't know what you mean, sir. Blood, Flens. Don't be afraid of the word. The smell of blood. Don't dance around it like a newborn chick. 
The colonel has finally turned his copper look to Flint's, and it's worse than his smoke words. Time was the griffin race reveled in blood. The greatest of hunters would drink a goblet of it every full moon to signify their prowess, to instill their respect. Gravel turns towards the window, overlooking the line, and Flens expects the gra glass to crack from the intensity of his glare. But now look at us. We've hunted our lands clean. We've scoured our fields, stocked our forests. Now, instead of spear and claw, we must learn diplomacy and kowtow. All fancy words for begging, pleading for help, and aid from other kingdoms. The mighty Griffin Empire, groveling on the doorstep of Saddle Arabia. The mighty Griffin Empire, mewling like a babe to the dignitaries of Mertonia. The mighty Griffin Empire. And here Crevel stops, his smoke taking an acidic tone. Scourging and crawling under cover of night to take equestrian cows and smuggle equestrian prey just to sustain ourselves. Fleece's beak hangs slightly after this, and studying the colonel's composure is suddenly and lurchingly reminded of what the vermin he hunted in his youth saw as his claws ensnared their throats. The colonel sighs quietly, and his voice returns to its normal, honeyed smog. But it must be done, I'm afraid. The very same politicians and advisers who ridiculed me for my effectiveness during the war now come to me in shambles, asking for my counsel, for my help. Cravel inhales through his nose, closing his copper eyes. He's quiet for a while, and remains deathly still. Flens is about to quietly exit the room, when Cravel opens his eyes again, and speaks, his voice low and relaxed. Do you know, Flens, what the phrase Deus ex machina means? He did not. I'm afraid not, sir. It means God from a machine, Flints. An impossible solution to an impossible problem. The colonel's voice hardens again. That's what these leeches, these parasites, ask of me. And so I give it to them. Here the colonel smiles. And it is a cold and terrible thing, a thin leer of abject evil and malice that chills Flints to the very core. I am their god, says the colonel. His claw reaches for the large red lever jutting out of the console. And this is my machine. With a loud clunk, Cravel pulls the switch, and the line rumbles to life. Lights flicker and spark to life, whirling as they spin in their glass cases. Alarms sound and steam hisses through the copper pipes. Metal shrieks and groans as large bay doors open, and soon the hellish symphony is joined by another noise. Cows. Hundreds and hundreds of equestrian cows pour through the holding doors, braying and calling to each other, their panicked screeches heard even in the observation room. Where are you taking us? Please, oh stars, please, let us go, please, please. My name's Daisy Joe. I can't see, I'm blind. Oh, Celestia, preserve me. The cattle flow in, their brown bodies rolling and jerking in from a solid mass like a river. The blinders over their eyes assure they can go nowhere other than where the cattle prods of their handlers instruct. 
Flens watches in awed horror. He had heard of the lying, even heard the screams, but he had never seen it in action. Not like this. Cravel watches with cold satisfaction, that horrible smile still twisted on his beak. Wonderful, isn't it? They look quite succulent. This meat will fetch a good price, I'm sure. Flens gulps again, and his mouth feels like sandpaper. I'm sure it w will, sir. He starts to back out of the room slowly. The smile vanishes, and Cravel's voice cracks like a whip. Stay. I want you to see this, Flens. Wincing, Flens returns to the thin glass window, his eyes glued to the scene below. One of the cows is jolted forward by a prod. She is shaking violently, drool and mucus hanging from her lips and nose. Her mouth judders and moves constantly, repeating the same phrase over and over. My name is Daisy Doo. I, I, I have a calf. I, I, I can't f find my, my calf. I can't find her anyway. Anywhere. My, my name's D Daisy. Another jolt. She gives a strangled yelp, hobbling forward blindly as the griffin handlers restrain her, in her front, from her front in a long conveyor belt with a rail above it. Hearing the movements, the cow turns frantically towards the source of the noise, her chest heaving. H who's that? Who? Who's, oh, st stars. Oh, m m my name's Daisy J Joe. P p please, have you s seen my calf? She needs needs me. She she needs her mama. Oh, C Celestia. The handlers silently lower the gleaming metal device and clamp it to the cow's head. A large cylinder pressing in itself to her forehead. Air hisses into a tank as it pressurizes. The griffin's expressions are unreadable. The cow is sobbing now, her voice strangled. Please. Please, Celestia, no! I need my calf! She needs me! Maybuck! Maybuck, where are you? Oh, stars! Stop! St stop! 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 Thunk! The cow jerks, her mouth working soundlessly. Slowly, crimson lines snake down her quivering face from where the barrel is pressed. They mix with the blood and slime, pattering to the ground as yellow rivets drip down her hind legs. In short order, the griffins reach up to the rail, pulling down a wicked hook and chain, and stabbing it near the groin of the cow. As a winch turns, the bolt gun is released, letting more blood spill from the neat hole in her skull. The chains clank, and her body is lifted and suspended. A sharp crack is heard as the meat hook grinds against the hip bone. The griffins reach down and remove the blinder showing two deep brown eyes, shot wide open in horror, unmoving and unblinking. More blood pours from her wound, followed by a flash of pale white and a chunk of gray, all falling wetly to the cold metal below. The engines groan, and Daisy Joe moves down the line. Back in the observation room, Flens breathes in shakily, unable to take his highs off the scene. Cravel's voice is impassive. He barely even acknowledges Flens as he silently turns and leaves the room, stopping only briefly at the door. Your resignation is denied. Get back to work. The door clicks quietly shut behind him. In the grassy plains, deep in the Griffin Empire, a large and entirely unremarkable concrete building sits beneath the twilight sky. One by one, its lights flicker on, and the quiet rumble of machinery can be heard inside. Two more shipments were arriving today, and they had been instructed to prepare early. Made for good business, it was said. And business was good indeed.